So we're going to review for lab test three, which we're going to have on Tuesday. And uh, if you have your lab manual, you can follow along in your lab med manual. We're going to start, and I have a few up here uh, if anybody wants to put one on their table to share with other people. We're going to start with human genetics. So specifically, guys, humans have 46 chromosomes, and they're divided into two major groups called autosomes and sex chromosomes. If you want to see a picture of these chromosomes, it's page 123 in your lab manual. And so it says, where are the autosomal characteristics carried? Autosomal characteristics are chromosomes 1 through 22. Chromosome pairs 1 through 22. Humans have 23 pairs of chromosomes. And pairs 1 through 22 are just regular chromosomes that you get a homologous pair of one from your mom, one from your dad, and they're completely homologous. And of course, sex link traits would be on the X and if you have it, the Y chromosome. So not everybody has a Y chromosome, like I don't have a Y chromosome. So I'm just going to put the 23rd pair of chromosomes. They're the XX chromosomes for females and the XY chromosome for males. Um, you may remember that the X chromosome, and you can see a picture of this again on page 123, you can see that the X chromosome is really big compared to the Y chromosome. And so most uh, sex link traits are on the X chromosome. You go, Sergio. But we do have, you know, males have a few traits on the Y chromosome. Are you okay with question number one? Okay, so if you want to find this one, it's on page 122. What chromosomal abnormality is associated with Down syndrome? Good. That's good, Terry. So instead of getting two 21st chromosomes, these individuals get three 21st chromosomes. Make sure you can tell a Down syndrome karyotype by looking at the karyotype. What is a karyotype? It's a picture of a person's chromosomes, exactly. So make sure you can look at a karyotype and determine if a child has Down syndrome. Okay, looking at a karyotype, how do you tell the sex of an individual from a karyotype? Look at the 23rd pair, and so if you see on the 23rd pair two big chromosomes, then what do you have? Yeah, there are two X chromosomes, so what do you have? Female. You see one big chromosome and then this little bitty thing. That's a male. And again, you guys are right, you look at the 23rd pair which is always on the lower right-hand corner of a karyotype, the lower right-hand corner. It's where we always put them. Hey, Stephanie, you want to hand out? Okay, number four. What chromosomal abnormalities are associated with each of these? And to follow along on this one, guys, I have it on page 125. Page 125. In case you've forgotten, they're on page 125. So what chromosomal abnormality is associated with Turner syndrome? Only one, Only one X. So to show that we're missing the other X, we put a zero in that second position. And again, you may have filled out the table 10.1 for Turner syndrome. Okay, how about poly X? Three X's. Excellent job. And again, these are both females. What about Klein Felters? Very good, Brittany. 2X and a Y. This one's male. 
And how about Jacob's? Very good. An X and two Y's. Morning. You want a handout? And again, if anybody needs to move so they can see better, we do have some spots in the back where if, you know, if you're just, just very uncomfortable, then feel free to move so you can just see the screen. But okay on these. Okay. Then what we did that day is we switched gears from people that have too many chromosomes or not enough chromosomes. We switched to just disorders uh, and looking at the genetics of just simple genes. You know, the, these people don't have too many chromosomes or not enough. They just have their regular 46 chromosomes. So this is just regular genetics. Number five. If a person's homozygous dominant, and I went ahead and put like big A, big A, or the person is heterozygous, what characteristic will they show? Will they be dominant or will they be recessive? They're going to be dominant. Very good. The dominant trait will show in their phenotype. How about if an individual is homozygous recessive? They're going to look recessive. That's good. Their phenotype will be recessive. And that's the only way that you have a phenotype that is recessive. You have to be homozygous recessive. Question six. You would expect the dominant trait to be the most common trait in a population. Is this always true? No. 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 Now, we've been talking about evolution can you think of some reasons why a recessive trait might be more common in a population? Okay. So Terry's point is the environment might favor the recessive. I got one. We just started talking about this last time. The founder effect. Now, the individual animals or the individual humans that started this new population, they were all recessive. So the population is recessive. It could just be the founder effect. It could be natural selection, like what Terry said, the environment might favor the recessive. But it could just be by chance that the founders of the population were recessive. It could be that they're all from a common ancestor that was recessive. I agree with that. Wouldn't natural selection still change it up a bit with mutations? Um, so mutation is what natural selection picks from, and that's how you got the recessive trait in the first place. So I agree that mutation is how we got the recessive trait. But then natural selection picked it, so to speak. Okay. So really, number seven doesn't tell you to do anything. Number seven is just a reminder that you're going to have to do genetics problems on the test. It says, I'm going to give you information about a trait, and I'm going to tell you what is dominant and what is recessive, and you're going to have to work genetics problems. So let me just give you some examples from your book of things that would be like what would be on the test. So follow me to page 127 at the bottom of the page. And remember, I'm always going to tell you what's dominant, what's recessive, so you don't worry about memorizing any of that silliness. But Nancy and the members of her family, remember we did a question together about uh, earlobes in her family, and that, so that would be a good question, something like that. And on the next page, I have Joe and his family, and on the next, uh, the next one is Henry and about him being adopted and the hair on the back of his hands. So those are all good questions that we did together that are just basic genetics questions. But okay on that, number seven is just a reminder to just kind of go back and reread those problems. So I went ahead and came up with a problem just for fun. This is, this is not on your review sheet. If I just take a look at the screen, I got two people that have widow's peak. Now, widow's peak is dominant. 
having a straight hairline is recessive. Okay, so I got this mom and this dad, they both have a widow's peak. And then they have three children. Two of their kids have widow's peaks. One of their kids has a straight hairline. What are the genotypes for each of these five people? So let's start with the parents. Both of the parents have widow's peaks. They're heter they have to be heterozygous, that's right. And then let's start with the easy kid. One of those kids is easy. Which one's the easy kid? It's the recessive one. Because the recessive one for sure is little w, little w. But what about the other two? They have widow's peaks. They could be big W, big W. Or they could be big W, little w. So collectively, what can we say about them? Big W, question mark. See, they're hard because they could be either one. You can look at those parents and tell those kids could have got a big W from their mom and a big W from their dad. That's possible. Or they may have gotten a big W from their mom and a little W from their dad. We don't know. So both of those kids are big W question mark. Right, okay, on the kids. Great. Okay, number eight, to true or false. Sex chromosomes carry only genes that relate to the sexual characteristics or the sexual functions of an individual. That's false. So the X chromosome is loaded with genes that have nothing to do with your sexuality like color vision you may remember color vision is on your X chromosome the ability to make clotting factor number eight thus to clot your blood that's on the X chromosome so this definitely is false so traits on the X chromosome this is number nine traits on the X chromosome are called X-linked traits and they are inherited differently than just regular autosomal traits. How are they inherited differently? Like who tends to have the disorders that are on the X chromosomes? Males. Yes, yeah, so the males have the disorders or males show the disorders. What do females do? They carry them. It is rare to see a female with the actual disorder. And again, it's because females get two X chromosomes, so we get two opportunities to inherit a dominant gene. Men get one X chromosome, so they only get one opportunity to inherit the dominant gene. These traits that I'm referring to as disorders are all recessive, They're recessive disorders. Okay, I have no pedigree symbols. Okay, so let's go over to pedigrees. And while we're going over there, guys, um, I want to point out to you that you do have to be able to work X-linked trait problems. If you'll follow with me, page 129, we did color blindness problems. And on page 130 at the top, we did number three and four, and those are on color blindness, which is an X-linked recessive trait. So go back and reread the problems we did together. Just refresh your memory on how to, to work those. And then that brings us to our pedigrees. Um, what does a circle stand for on a pedigree? Female. And square is male. And then what do you do if one of the individuals has the disorder? You color it in. You go, Angelina. Next question, does a pedigree show genotypes or phenotypes? You figure the genotypes out. They, pedigrees show phenotypes, and then you have to figure out the genotypes. All a pedigree tells you is if they have it or they don't. Do they have the disorder or they don't? And then you have to logically work through the genotypes. 
Now, as you can imagine, I'm going to put pedigrees on the lab test, pictures of families. And so um, it's going to be multiple choice, as usual, on what is the inheritance pattern. And your three choices are at the top of page 131. These are the three choices we went over in both lab and lecture. Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked recessive. Those are your three choices. So just for fun, I made up a pedigree. Everybody look at the screen. And again, if you can't see it well, you can position yourself to see the screen. And so the first thing you have to do on a pedigree is figure out the inheritance pattern. That would be the first question on the test. What's the inheritance pattern? And your three choices are right there on page 131. Autosomal dominant, autosomal recessive, X-linked recessive. Anybody have a nomination? It's recessive. What kind of recessive? Autosomal. How come it's not X-linked? Yeah, I'm seeing it showing up in boys and girls. So it seems to be autosomal recessive. Does everybody agree with Josh? You're okay? All right, so let's just use the letter A for the trait. How do we figure that out again? That's recessive? Yes. Okay, so we look at the clues. and That's right. Terry says look at the clues, and Josh nominated autosomal recessive. The clues are neither parent is affected and a few of the children are affected. Now, here's my original parents right here. They don't have it, but one of their three children does. So that means it's just, they're, they're just carriers? Very good. So using the letter A, guys, using the letter A, let's go ahead and do these two parents. The first parent is generation one, individual one, the original mom. What's her genotype? I'm sorry. Nope, it's not X-linked, it's autosomal. Big a it's just big A, little a. And how about um, who she's mating with her husband, generation one, individual two? Same thing. Same thing. Okay, now, look at, I'm, I'm just going to do these three kids, which are generation two, individual two. The first born child was a daughter. Okay, look at her, what is she? Okay, is she probably big A, little a, or is she for sure big A, little a? She's for sure. How come? Because of that kid right there. She's for sure. Yeah, she's for sure. Yeah. Okay, let's do the second born daughter, which is generation two, individual three. She is big A, question mark. Tell me why. Yeah, there's not enough information there because she didn't have any offspring yet. And so she could be big A, big A. She could be big A, little A. We don't know. Is everybody okay on why Linda nominated big A question mark? So we're, we're saying that little A means that they have the disease? So let's go to in, uh, generation two, individual four. Benjamin said, I think we need to do that individual, and I agree. What Using the letter A, what is generation two, individual four? Little a, little a, and that is what we're saying. That is true. How do we know if it's, if the big A is the bad guy or the little one, A is the little Okay, so it goes back to the same thing Terry and Josh were telling you earlier. You look at the clues. Okay, and I'm on page 131, the table at the top. The clue that neither parent had the disease and just a few of the children did. Okay. So that number three would be little a. Uh, generation three, individual three, is little a, little a, for sure. Mm -hmm. And so one and five would be considered autosomal dominant, right? Okay, generation what? Two. two. Okay, generation two, individual four is recessive. Okay, so let me be clear. The trait... You know, having the disease or not having the disease, the disease is recessive. That's what I'm saying. You're looking at a disease here. Okay, like maybe this is sickle cell. We could be looking at a family for sickle cell disease. So how do you know which one's X? 
Okay, so how would you know when it's an X-linked trait? It's only carried on. But what are the clues that would tell you it's an... It's just in the males. And what are males? Are they circles or squares? They're squares. So you're going to just see the squares colored in. You just see, and there wouldn't be a bunch, because X-linked is recessive, X-linked recessive. So there's not going to be very many in the family that have it, but they're going to be squares. So the women are autosomally recessive and the male are X-linked recessive? No. This trait is autosomal. It's a trait. Yeah, it's a trait. Okay. We're also going to have blood type on this, blood type. This is their genetics problems. We're going to do blood type. Do you guys remember what is dominant and what's recessive on blood type? A is dominant. B is co-dominant. B is dominant. O is recessive. So let me repeat that. A is dominant. B is also dominant. We call them co-dominant. They both dominate. O is recessive. Okay, so we have Susan as blood type A, and Jack is AB. What are possible blood types of their children? You guys are just rattling off stuff. Okay, so let's work it. When in doubt, work it out. So I wanted to remind you that I just took this from your lecture notes. You don't have to write it down. But I wanted to remind you that a person who's blood type A could be homozygous or heterozygous. And I think Susan was blood type A. So which do you nominate that we use, AA or AO? AO. For sure, bless you. We're going to use AO because we don't know, so we assume her to be AO. It's a pretty good assumption because O is very common. Okay, so assume she's hiding an O in her phenotype. Okay, bless you. Okay, so I'm going to put in the O here. Here's Susan on the side. And here, was that Jack? Mm -hmm. Jack is across the top. Does everybody see how I got these parents? Okay, so you guys were saying that they could have had a kid that was A. And I see that right here. Both of those kids could be A. They could have a kid that's AB. Could they have a kid that's B? It is a possibility. Could they have a kid that's O? No. No. It's not going to happen. Not if it's Jack's kid. Jack cannot have a kid that has O because O is recessive, and Jack does not carry O. He doesn't have it. So he cannot have a kid with O. Are you okay on that? Okay, great. Say it again. Um, so the answers will be phenotypes, not genotypes. So uh, I'll have blood type A, blood, blood type B, blood, blood type AB, and blood type O. And it will be choose all that apply. So you would have to choose A, and you would have to choose B, and you would have to choose A, B, but don't choose O because Jack and Susan cannot have a baby with O. This is going to be a choose all that apply question, which means has multiple answers. Yeah, so to make sure everybody's clear, they could have a kid with A, they could have a kid that's B, and they could have a kid that's A, B. It's okay on the blood typing. Super. So I think that that takes care of exercise 10 human genetics. Does anybody need anything repeated there? Ha uh ha. -huh. You so funny. Okay, so I have DNA biology and technology, and there's these three words that you have to know. And if some of you are thinking, man, this test is going to be easy because there's a lot of review, the answer is yes. This test should be easy because there's just a lot of review, a lot of stuff we've had before. So this was something I drew one day in lecture, and it has three red arrows up here. It's a central dogma that was developed by Francis Crick. 
And I want to talk about what goes on each arrow. And to make sure you're clear, those are your three choices. Replication, transcription, translation. So let's start with this first arrow, which shows DNA can be used to make more DNA. What's that called? This one's replication. It's where DNA is made from DNA. It's called replication. Okay, and then RNA is made from DNA. What's that called? Translation. Make up your mind. Transcription. Transcription. And then an amino acid sequence or protein is made from RNA. That's called translation. translation. Okay, on those three words. Okay, question two. What are the three parts of a DNA nucleotide? Well, I'm going to draw it. Good morning, Haley. That's a nucleotide. And let's see if you can remember what those three parts are. Can, so give me started. What's the P with the circle around it? Phosphate. That's the phosphate. And how about the pentagon with the S? Okay, so let me tell you, sugar is not on your test. The word deoxyribose is on your test. And since we're talking about DNA, make sure you pick deoxyribose. The word sugar is not even on your test. So you don't worry about picking it. It's not there. Okay, okay and then what's the B in the box? Base, so the bases. Okay, now let's just review. Since we're talking about DNA, what are the possible bases that could be in that spot? A, C, G. That's a bad G. Let me try that G again. What's the last one? T. Yeah, those bases can be either an A, a C, a G, or a T. That's what varies. Is it okay on the nucleotides, ma'am? That's very good. A goes with T. C goes with G. Okay, so everybody in the room knows DNA is double-stranded, and it looks kind of like a ladder. And so in DNA, what parts make up the sides of the ladder? And when I mean the parts, I am talking about the phosphate sugars or bases. So what makes up the sides of the ladder? Phosphate and the sugar, yeah. And we say those are the structural parts or the backbone of the DNA. And then if you say DNA looks like a ladder, then what are the rungs, or if you don't like the word rungs, the steps of the ladder, the bases. And that's where Kayla's talking about how A goes with T to make a step on the ladder, or C goes with G to make a step on the ladder. So that's a good reminder, Kayla. Kayla says you're going to have to know A goes with T and C goes with G, just like before. you got to know that. So one day we were uh, doing this activity and we built this model. I took a picture of the models that we were building and I drew some white arrows on it. So I, t I think I told you this, not to memorize any colors because I can move all the colors around, but to memorize the basic structure here. And so I think everybody will agree that these green and red, blue and black rods, those are the bases. Does everybody agree on that? Okay, so these are bases.
Okay, then next, I'm just going to go up above that. Next, I see these black pentagons that the bases are attached to. I'm going to the arrow right above where I wrote the word bases. What am I pointing at there? Deoxyribose. That's good. Got to write small. Okay, now come on up to my next arrow, which is the white tube. That's phosphate. So some of you have figured this out. The bases are always attached to the sugar. You see how the bases are always attached to the sugar. And then the phosphate's the linker. Okay, then I have one more arrow here in the middle where there's this clear rod attaching the two bases. What would that be? Tell me again. Hydrogen bond. That stands for a hydrogen bond. That's what's holding the bases together. Thus, that's what's holding the two sides of the DNA molecule together. Represents the hydrogen bonds. Okay, so let's just pretend that green was A. Let's just pretend green was A. What would red be? T. T. Let's per pretend that black was G. So what would blue be? C. C. Everybody okay with that? Just a nice visual reminder. Don't miss the easy question. What's the name of this molecule? What's the name of this whole molecule? DNA. That's the easy question. And then I'll ask you the parts. It's okay? Ma'am? Yeah, all the parts. Okay, so again, keeping in mind that A goes with T, C goes with G, I'm going to give you this strand of DNA, and it says, um, I just have, if, you, if I give you a piece of DNA, predict the base sequence on the new strand, but I thought it'd be fun if we go ahead and practice. So let's practice together as a class. Can you help me out here on the other strand? There's a three prime right here, so what goes right here? Five. Five. Okay, go ahead. A. Don't say you. Somebody said you. Okay. A, T, go ahead. G. You guys can do that? No problem? And also, guys, I just want to point out that the strands are running in opposite directions. They're anti-parallel. So that's why if it's three prime on the top, that's why you told me to put five prime on the bottom. They run next to each other, but they're going in the opposite directions. Say it again. That's the directionality, like east and west. Okay, I need some differences in structure and composition comparing DNA to RNA. And I'm just going to make a little table here because I'm lazy. Okay, so DNA has T and RNA has U. Okay, what else? Deoxyribose. Okay, so this one has deoxyribose. And RNA has ribose. Okay, I need one more thing. Double stranded. And that's right, single stranded. Okay, so to recap, DNA has T, but RNA doesn't. Instead, it has U. U. DNA uses the sugar deoxyribose, RNA uses the sugar ribose, and DNA is a double-stranded molecule, and RNA is a single-stranded molecule. You know, count those differences. Just, again, a, a nice review. Okay, so that day we built something here. I took a picture. What is this? What kind of RNA? Sergio's right. This is M. 
because we did the activity together. We took pictures. Now, if this is M, well, first of all, how'd you know it was R? Everybody agrees it's RNA. How'd you know? Single stranded. Okay, now, what are the parts? So let's start here on the bottom. Let's start with this easy one right here. This one right here. Right there. What is this white arrow right here pointing at? That's phosphate. Okay, what's this arrow pointing at? Huh? Thank you, ribose. We don't know exactly what this arrow is pointing at, but we could say a general term for what that arrow is pointing at, a base. And so Benjamin and others say, well, how do you know that one's messenger RNA? Because in the context of the whole lesson, we, we did see the other RNAs, and I'll show you some pictures of them in just a moment. But I'm going to move to number five to a vocabulary word, codon. Now, codon is in the messenger RNA. If you use the word codon, you're talking about messenger RNA. And it's a three bases, like ACC, that's a codon, or UGA, that's a codon. So it's three bases, and a codon is always associated with the molecule called messenger RNA. Now these three bases code for something and that's why we call them a codon. What do they code for? One more time. What proteins are made of? Amino acids, yeah. Mm-hmm. Can I use AA as an abbreviation? What's AA stand for? Amino acid. Okay, now we're going to take a moment just to make sure that everybody has this. Is we're going to need it. Hey, good to see you. And it's called the genetic code. Could you fish out your genetic code? I'm trying to get a hold of it, Lois. I'm doing a poor job. Yeah, you need a genetic code. If you don't have one, I have extras here in the front. You need a genetic code. Thank you. Okay, so there's all your codons. Do I have a genetic code? There's all your codons right there, and then what they code for. So I wanted you to have this just lock in on this visual as we look at this question. What is a codon? Three bases from messenger RNA. What does it do? It codes for an amino acid. Okay, now when a cell is using the messenger RNA and making the protein, we said that's called translation. We said that a few minutes ago. But there's a little organelle, a tiny little organelle that helps with this translation. Does anybody remember who that little organelle is? tRNA helps. Right. Ribosome. Ribosomes, that's all they do is they help with translation. So we learn that they're the little kitchens where the proteins are made. So you have to be able to transcribe and translate on the test next Tuesday. So we're going to start with transcribe. So I came up with this little sequence for us to practice with. First of all, what does that even mean? Like, what am I supposed to do? What am I supposed to make? I'm supposed to make mRNA. If I say transcribe, you're supposed to make RNA. Don't make DNA, because you know I'm going to give you that choice. It's a multiple choice question, so I'm going to take this and make DNA from it just to see if I could mess you up. Don't make DNA. If I tell you to transcribe, you need to make RNA. So go ahead and get me started, class. This is three prime, so this would be five.
Okay, now what do you call these three bases right here? Right there? What's that called? That's a codon. Yeah? Everybody get the idea of what a codon is? But okay, on transcribing. Okay. All right, so to answer your question earlier, Benjamin, how do you know that that molecule that I said was mRNA, how do I know it's mRNA in the context of the whole thing? And here is the whole thing. Okay, first of all, you didn't argue with me that it was RNA. Everybody said, yeah, that's RNA. But how do you know it's mRNA? So look at the whole thing. I've got this big molecule across the top, and I'll just put an arrow on that. And then I have this organelle, and then I have these three molecules that I'm putting checks on right here. They're all RNA of some kind. So in the context of the whole thing, that's how I knew the big one going across the top. Well, you tell me, this one right here going across the top, what is that? MRNA. That one's mRNA. How about this blue organelle right there? What is that? That's a ribosome. It's made out of rRNA. There's the ribosome. And then these little check boxes down here, what do they stand for? That's tRNA. And I have one, two, three of those in my picture. I see three tRNAs. Okay, so did that help answer your question? How did I know? I know in, in the context of the whole activity. With all the players present, you can figure it out. Okay, now, first of all, this picture is of one thing. What is this? This is tRNA. So I'm going to put that up here in case you didn't realize this is tRNA. All right, now tRNA has two parts that are significant. The first part are these three colored tubes right here at the top. What are they? Anticodon. This is the anticodon. And the second really significant part. It's this black thing down at the bottom. Anybody? Amino acid. Very good. Is that Brittany? Well done. That's an amino acid. Amino acid. Because that's what transfer RNA carries, right? Amino acid. Okay, on the parts of the tRNA. Now, why did I ask you this question? It's on our review sheet. Um, I have question number seven. What two components necessary for the process of translation are carried by tRNA? Here's your two components. The anticodon and the amino acid. That's the answer to the first part of question number seven. The two components necessary for the process of translation are the anticodon and the amino acid. Got that. So I thought we should practice anticodons. So look what I gave you. First of all, what I gave you, you tell me. The, these six letters I have at the top on the screen, what I gave you, is that DNA or RNA? RNA. What kind of RNA? RNA? It is. Because, look, I told you that these are codons. And the word codon goes with mRNA. And now I want anticodons. The, that goes with tRNA. Okay, so go ahead and tell me the first anticodon. Go ahead. Easy. Just have to remember who goes with who, right? Everybody's okay on that. Super. 
Okay. Then I have this other thing up here on the screen. It says translate. What the heck? What does that mean? What are we supposed to make if we translate? Amino acid sequence? That's what I mean. Translate means make amino acid sequence. So is this going to be on our test Tuesday? Is this chart going to be on our test Tuesday? You know it. It's one of the, my favorite things in biology. I'm sticking it on every test I can. Okay? All right. So everybody grab their genetic code and let's translate this. If you don't have one, I have extras here in the front. Grab your genetic code. Tell me again, Kayla. Mm -hmm. The thionine, MET, okay. Arginine, okay. Tyrosine. Stop. What will happen if you hit that? It'll stop. That's right. That's good. Sorry? I did the whole thing. Oh, thank you. Yes. And, and we did that for the test, the lecture test three. We used the first three letters. And I'm going to do that. Just to be consistent to what we had done before. Yes, yeah, so you'll only see the first three letters for each amino acid on the test Tuesday, just to be consistent. Good question. Okay. All right, so we're going to dig through our notebook now or wherever we keep our stuff, and I'm looking for a handout that's called electrophoresis. It's the day that we use these gels and we applied electricity to them. And we made proteins and pigments move in the gels. It's called electrophoresis. Let's dig through our stuff so we can find that handout. Electrophoresis. And right now, if you have it, and I hope you do, it, you did a drawing of a test tube on the back. So flip it over and find the drawing of the test tube that you did. If you don't have it, then maybe somebody on your table does, and they can help you. Because you were absent. Is there anybody who couldn't find their electrophoresis handout and needs one? We're all, we're all good? Okay, so we had some banana cell extract on our table that day. We also had SDS and we had ethanol, which is an alcohol. And we did a DNA extraction or DNA isolation technique that day. And we had to figure out why we needed those three ingredients. What role did each ingredient play? So why did we need the banana cell extract? Yeah. That's our source of DNA. You can't extract DNA unless you have DNA. Why did we need the detergent SDS? Emulsify. And we wanted to emulsify the membranes of the banana cell. That way the DNA could be freed from the cells and float up when we were doing our extraction. And then why did we need the ethanol? It pulled the DNA. It's almost like it was a chemical DNA magnet. It pulled the DNA up out of the mixture so that we could grab it. But okay on that question. Super. Now keep that electrophoresis there, but let's go to the front of that page and look at the first sentence. What is gel electrophoresis used for? Separating, Separating molecules. That's good. Mm 
It's a separation technique. That's good. Upon what basis does gel electrophoresis separate molecules? That's good. What makes the molecules migrate, like move? Electricity. Yeah, you had to plug it in and turn it on. Remember, we even made sure it, the electricity was flowing by look, we look for bubbles. So the answer is electricity. If you don't plug it in and turn it on, nothing happens. Okay, then we looked at the um, data, and I remember we uh, collected everybody's data in the class, and in the middle of the page it says each protein has an isoelectric point, the pH at which the protein has no charge at all. In solutions with a pH higher than the isoelectric point, the protein becomes more and more negative. In pH solutions lower than the isoelectric point, a protein becomes more and more positive. And then we practice guessing what a charge would be for a protein in the chart below. So I see where we practice that. So thinking about that, I came up with this little pretend gel for us to look at. Okay, first of all, I want to know, and pretend these are proteins, I want to know which of these proteins are positively charged. One and five. Okay, on one and five. And that means two, three, and four are Negative. negatively charged. Everybody okay on that? Okay. Now, out of all five of the proteins, which of these proteins have an isoelectric point closest to seven? And I want you to notice the liquid in the chamber was seven. Four. Number four. How come? Because it didn't move very far. Okay. Everybody's okay on that? So that's what I mean by, like, relative to each other, who will move far and who won't move far. You can tell by their isoelectric points and the pH of the buffer. It's pretty simple. There's nothing hard about it. Just remember, small things don't move very, excuse me, small things do move very far, big things don't. So that's why our proteins didn't move very far, because proteins are big. Remember, positive things move negative, negative things move positive. It's really pretty simple. Opposites. That's good. Okay, and I think that takes us to the back. Now, in your notebook somewhere, since you've been digging around, you probably know where it's at. You have one more page to find. It's your fossil page that has the uh, protein clock on the back. And you will find one more page. Fossils on the front, protein clock on the back. And again, if that's something that you need, I have extras in the front. Okay, so you could probably come up with this definition without thinking about it. If you wonder where I'm getting this at, you probably, I hope, wrote it down in your lab manual on page 149. We've been talking about evolution for a couple weeks now, and I hope it's kind of at least the definition, the biological definition of evolution is kind of sunk in on you, where it's the genetic change in populations over time. Genetic change in populations over time. Okay, on the definition. 
How does evolution explain the unity of life? Like, why is it all cells have DNA and that DNA A goes with T and C goes with G? And why is it that all cells have messenger RNA that's made from common. DNA? And why is it common ancestry? Good. Okay, how does evolution explain the diversity of life? So why am I different than a bird? Like, what happened? If I've got common ancestry with all life, then why are humans different than raccoons? And, okay. Mutation, natural selection. Okay, so we have many mechanisms. Time has passed. And let me ask you this. Um, as the surface of the earth, the same everywhere? No. So different environments have caused natural selection. We've had mutation, genetic drift. That's good. Okay, so I'm going to first put that there are many environments on Earth. Anybody agree with that? Okay, so there are many environments. And natural selection has been huge in creating the diversity of life. It's a big one. But natural selection had to have choices, and so somebody mentioned mutation. Mutation's important because it gave natural selection choices. Yeah, so that's another big one. Genetic drift has been big. Migration, you know, all the things we've been talking about. So all the mechanisms of evolution that you and I have been talking about explain the diversity of life. Diversity of life. So that's good. Okay, on page 150, you don't have to memorize the geological time scale, but I do want you to go back and just read over it, review it, and there are three words that you do have to know their meanings of, the meanings. And the first one is Paleozoic. What does Paleozoic mean? Good. Mesozoic, middle. Cenozoic. <laughs> That's key. That's I like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's cute. I like that. I like that a lot. Okay, everybody look at the um, uh, geological time scale. Let me ask you some questions. Who evolved first, reptiles or amphibians? Look at the geological time scale and see who evolved first, reptiles or amphibians? Amphibians. That's good. Who evolved first, amphibians or fish? Fish. Who evolved first, cone-bearing plants or flowering plants? Flowering plants came first? Cone-bearing. Yeah, they're, they've been here longer. Cone-bearing. Like pine trees. If you're trying to think, what is she talking about? Stuff like pine trees, Okay. So cone-bearing plants came before flowering plants. Everybody's okay. The fish came before amphibians. Amphibians came before reptiles. How about this? Who came first, mammals or birds? Birds. 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 You're not looking. Oh. You thought it was mammals because you're a mammal. Mammals. Mammals are here first. Birds came later. Yeah, they're more recent. Yeah, so um, the mammals first appear during the Triassic, and the birds appear in the Jurassic. Yeah, yeah there's about 50 million years difference between mammals first appearing and then birds. Food is kind of small compared to that. We were, yeah, didn't do much, yeah. 
Insects go way back. Yeah, the first insects are the Devonian of the Paleozoic, first insects. They showed up about the same time the first amphibians. And that's because of going up on land. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so most of you know you've got to memorize some fossils. And there are 12 of them. I have pictures of them on Blackboard, but I also have them in the boxes in the back, back behind uh, where Javier is, those kind of maroon colored boxes. You have to know them by name and era. So I hope you wrote them down the day we went on, over them. That's all you have to know is what name, what era. My recommendation is to memorize them by era. All the fossils of one era, memorize them together. And then all the fossils of another era, memorize them together. That's how I would organize it. Okay, we have some vocabulary words at the top of page 154. And the first one is homologous. Homologous. I feel like it's the same structure. Same structure. Mm -hmm. So if you're comparing two skulls, for example, and you see that they have basically the same structure, you would say they have very high homology. So you're looking at structure when you're doing comparative anatomy. That's good. How about analogous? Similar function. So this one is function. You don't use analogy, analogy to prove evolution, right? So Benjamin wants to know the answer to this question. So do I. Does homologous or analogous represent a closer evolutionary relationship? Homologous. The answer is homologous. We use structure. Because structure comes from genes. How you're built, it comes from genes, and so we know relation is due to your genes. That's why your mom is your mom or your uncle is your uncle, because of the genes. Okay, there's basically one answer to this question. What accounts for the many differences between chimpanzees and human skeletons? We did this on page 156 and 157. It's basically one thing. Why is our skeleton different than theirs? Posture. It's our posture. Very good. Because we're on two feet and they're still on four. Okay, the skulls, page 158, is really two things, two. Yeah, ours is real flat, but why? Brain size. Brain size for this part. How about this part? Diet. Diet, very good. So the top part is brain size, and then the chin part is diet. Now our brain size is much larger, so we got the really expanded area here, and then we're omnivores, so we don't need as much uh, musculature here on our jaw, so we have a smaller jaw, whereas they're herbivores primarily. Everybody's okay on that? Great. Okay. So I got these animal skulls. I got a blackboard with pictures. Dahlia said they look pretty good. Um, you have to know the name of the skull and what kind of diet it has. So it would be things like herbivore, carnivore, omnivore. What do you look at on the skull to figure out their diet? Their teeth. Yeah, their teeth. So if you find all sharp teeth, Carnivore. How about if you find, um, first of all, no canines? It wouldn't have any of those. And then, yeah, and then there, these back here, the molars are really ground down. That would be an herbivore. What if you so find something kind of in the middle? Omnivore. Omnivore. Is it okay on that? And again, I have a really good PowerPoint of that, or you could just go back and take a look at them. The little pink cards are back there, and you can figure out if you know what you're doing or not. 
I do want to reiterate what I told you the first day. If they're super close, like a cat and a bobcat, then both choices won't be on the test, okay? Because you can't tell a cat from a bobcat unless you have both skulls sitting there. So if they're super close, don't get freaked out about that. They, both choices won't be on the test, okay? So if I pick a cat, bobcats aren't going to be a choice, okay? What is a nutrient? It's, what does, they eat plant material, and they live in the water a lot, so... Algae, plant material, leaves. Tea, yeah. Huh? <laughs> they do have some mean tea. Yeah. I saw, a de- this is so beside the fact. We went to East Beach a couple weeks ago just to go shelling, walk around. There's this dead nutria right there on the, yeah. They must be okay in brackish water. I've seen them in Clear Creek and stuff, yeah. Mm-mm. It's crazy, dude, used to catch, like, snapping turtles. For me, uh, I remember like one time he like they called him in to get a nutrient and he like had to get like a stick and like he get the thing get onto the stick and he picked it up like that. Oh, that's crazy. Okay, the embryos. Page one fifty nine. So do um vertebrate embryos resemble one another? Yes, they do. Yeah, they're pretty close. Um the embryos that have lots and lots of similarities. If you're comparing two embryos and they look almost identical, like a pig embryo and maybe, I don't know, a cow embryo, what would that tell you about the pig and the cow if their embryos are so similar? They have recent common ancestry. What about the, if the embryos had a lot of differences, like maybe a fish embryo with a chick embryo? What would that mean? They have common ancestry, but would it be really recent? No. So they had common ancestry, but further back in time. So how does comparative embryology help determine relationships between organisms? More similarities more mean more recent common ancestry. Just makes sense. If they're very, very similar, they're going to have very close common ancestry, recent common ancestry. If they're quite different from each other, that means their common ancestry is very far back in time. Just makes sense. Okay, on that. Okay, I really like this question. Speaking of embryos, would you expect a human embryo to be more like a chick embryo or more like a pig embryo? Pig. And why? They're both mammals. Yeah, humans are mammals. Pigs are mammals. We share common ancestry with all mammals, so because they're both mammals. Okay, question eight. We are going to do on page 160 some basic biochemical molecules all living organisms have in common. I'll get us started because I can think of one so easy. RNA. Hold on, I haven't finished RNA. Uh, Many enzymes. I'm just going to throw one up here just for fun because you guys may remember this enzyme. ATP synthase, you got to have that or you can't make ATP. So many enzymes, many proteins, yeah. Okay, how come? Why do all cells have DNA, three kinds of RNA, ATP? Common ancestry. Okay, be able to determine the degree of relatedness based on the antibody-antigen reaction. Okay, that was page 161. And to remind you what we did, it was just last week, but what we did was we had a plastic container and we put um, serum in the container. Oh, yeah, yeah, it's this thing. Yeah. And first we put rabbit serum into it. 
into the container wells. Then we put cumin serum into the container wells. And then we tested the reaction against the serum of all these other animals. We looked for white precipitate. Did a lot of white precipitate mean you were closely related to humans or not closely related to humans? Closely related. It's real easy. Okay. And then lastly, this um, protein clock is going to be on your test. So just go back and review how to use the protein clock. I especially like question number three, something like question number three. It won't be question number three, but something like question number three where you have to compare two different sets of animals and figure out who's more closely related. I think we did one like that our last week in our uh, clicker question too. We did a clicker question in lecture. So we've used this a couple, three times now. Okay, so then lastly today, I have mechanisms of evolution. And I want to tell you that all of these definitions, these words that I have listed up here, they're all in your lecture notes. What a population is, a gene pool, what is mutation, what is gene flow, what is non-random mating, what is genetic drift, what is natural selection. Uh, but as, as far as your lab manual, if you want a page number for your lab manual, they are on page 166 in your lab manual. But I'm not going to spend uh, time because we are short, but you can find all of these definitions either in your lecture notes or in the lab manual, page 166. So on uh, Tuesday, we started working a new equation called the Hardy-Weinberg. And we did this in lecture and in lab that day. Does anybody remember, maybe you wrote it down on page 167, the purpose of the Hardy-Weinberg? You did write it down. Good. It means you have to know what it was before so you can tell if it has changed. Because you can't tell if something's changed if you didn't know what it was before. Okay, in the absence of evolution, how would you expect gene frequencies of a large population to change over time? If there's no evolution, what would the P's and the Q's the P squares, the two PQs, the Q squares, you know all those Hardy-Weinberg values? What would happen to them over time? They would stay the same, yeah. Equilibrium, they'd stay the same. Nothing would happen. They would stay the same because there's nothing that would change them. Evolution changes them. We're saying there's no evolution, so what would happen? It would stay the same. Number three is true or false. Okay, the frequency, that's how often you find it. The frequency of the recessive phenotype. That means how often I could find individuals that were recessive. The frequency of the recessive phenotype in a population equals the frequency of the homozygous recessive genotype. In other words, little a, little a. Is that true? Yes. yes. So you can count in a population how many individuals are recessive, and that is your percent, little a, little a. And you may also remember we call that Q squared. In Hardy-Weinberg, we call that Q squared. Okay, number four, still true or false. The frequency of the dominant phenotype, you know, go and count how many are dominant equals the frequency of the homozygous dominant genotype. That's false. How come that's false? Because you're not counting the heterozygous. Yeah. If you're dominant, you could be homozygous dominant. You could also be heterozygous. And the reason that I mentioned these two is you may notice when you and I work Hardy-Weinberg, we always start with Q squared because that's something we can know because number three is true, but number four is 
false. Because when you count somebody as being recessive, they are little a, little a. That is true. Everybody follow with me. If you count somebody as being dominant, they don't have to be big A, big A, right? They maybe are not. But if you count somebody as recessive, they have to be little a, little a. They have to be. Good. Okay, I told you this on um, Tuesday, but I want to reiterate. You have to know what every symbol of Hardy-Weinberg stands for. So page 167 at the top, you have to know that. So I'm going to say things like, um, what symbol in Hardy-Weinberg stands for the frequency of the dominant allele? And you have to pick P. Or I might say, what symbol in Hardy-Weinberg stands for percent heterozygous? And you have to pick 2PQ. Everybody understand what I'm saying? Great. Okay, let's say I give you a set of genotypic frequencies. Like, I'm just making this up. P equals 0.5, Q equals 0.5. Let's just say that's what I gave you. What would you expect the frequencies to be the next generation if the population's obeying Hardy-Weinberg? The same. What about after five generations? The same. How about after ten generations? The same. Because if a population is obeying Hardy-Weinberg, it's not evolving. It's in equilibrium. Two, exactly. Okay. To finish up, I um, have a hearty Weinberg, but I want to put this off because I'm going to do it downstairs. Um, so I'm jumping down. Distinguish between the founder effect and a bottleneck. Okay, what's the difference? Okay, so let me tell you a story. You ready? So I, I told you about the ship channel out there. Remember I told you they dug out the channel? Well, that means they had a bunch of dirt. So they piled it up out in the bay. And they made dredge islands. The bay had no islands out there. We made those islands. They're called dredge islands. There's some big ones out there. Okay, and so you go out to that island now, you're going to find plants and animals. As a matter of fact, lots of mosquitoes. Okay. Anyway, in my story, imagine this that there were these lizards hanging out in Sylvan Beach. And there was a little piece of wood, and they were sunning themselves on the wood, and a big wave came and grabbed the piece of wood and took it out into the bay. And so the little lizard's just holding on, holding on for their dear life, okay? And the little piece of wood landed on one of the dredge islands, and the lizards got off because they'd had enough of that trauma, okay? They got off. And they are on this island now, and they're stuck. But that's okay. They liked each other. They mated and had offspring. Now there's a bunch of lizards living on the island. What do you call that? That's the founder effect. There were no lizards. Now there's some lizards. And those lizards landing there was random. It's totally random. It's the founder effect. Okay? But then there's this horrible freeze. Not this year, okay? There's this horrible freeze. I heard one time there was a freeze here in the early 1900s. It was so cold. I'm not making this up. Somebody told me this. It was so cold. People could go down to Morgan's Point, break the ice, and catch all the fish they wanted. No way. That's what I was told. It's so cold. That's so cold. Now, some of the stories from back then, I don't believe. One guy told me he could walk from Morgan's Point to Baytown. I don't believe that. That's kind of crazy. Okay, but I do believe it was so cold that right there on the edges, it froze, and you could break the ice and catch the fish. Okay, so most of the lizards on the island died because of the freeze, but a few lived. And the few that live then set the genetic frequencies for the lizard populations that came to follow. What would that be? That's a bottleneck. You know, count the difference between founder effect and bottleneck. 
snake lizards. Okay, and then lastly, examples of selection pressures. Okay, I'll give you a hint. Camouflage. If you're not camouflaged, what's going to happen to you? So predation is a selection factor. Don't you think the threat of being eaten is a high natural selection pressure? Okay, what about disease? Do you think that would cause natural selection? Disease? Yep. Um, size. Size. Sometimes it's beneficial to be small, especially if you're prey. Sometimes it's beneficial to be large, especially if you're a predator. Yeah, so size is a selection pressure. Those are just a few, you know, whether you blend in or not, so your coloration, yes? I have a question. How come an elephant is not a predator eater? Like well, it's an, or it evolved from an herbivorous line. Uh, yeah. And as a matter of fact, guys, if you go and look, the largest land, an, largest animals that ever lived on land have been herbivores. Y'all go back and look at your history of dinosaurs. The largest dinosaurs are herbivores. The largest animals that exist are living very close to the bottom of the food chain because there's more food there. The bottom of the food chain is photosynthesis. There's more stuff to eat out there made from photosynthesis than anything else. So big animals often are real low in the food chain. That's true. Whales, they eat, especially the big whales, they eat krill, which is lower in the food chain because there's so much of it. No, just. <laughs> okay, guys, I'll see you guys downstairs. And we are going to start with a hearty wine bird, so have your calculators ready. I'm putting this on YouTube if you need it. What do you search for? You say on YouTube? My name. What is her name? Oh,